So, memory. Um, we use kind of, kind of a, a special thing for memory where we have an explicit uh, allocator model. So, memory allocations always happen through a specific allocator object. We don't use new, uh, we don't use delete, and we don't use malloc. And the reason for this is that we want to track all the memory usage in the application so that we have a handle on all the memory that's used and we know exactly how much memory is used. And also so that we can make sure that we're not leaking memory, uh, that we can assert when we quit the application uh, that we're not leaking memory. So we have a, a base class for allocations, which is the allocator class. It looks something like this. Um, that's a basic allocation function where you specify size and the alignment you want. If you need a specific alignment. And you get back an allocation result, which is actually is a pointer plus a size. And the reason you get back both a pointer and a size is that some systems are some systems have like um, uh, can only allocate in certain sizes. For example, when we allocate from uh, the page allocator, it will round up to the page size, which might be 4K or so. So you, so you might get back more memory than you requested. You'll never get back less memory than you requested, but you might get back more. Um, sometimes, sometimes in some cases, when you allocate memory, it's like, yeah, I, I just I need a bunch of memory, and whatever I get, I will make use of. It's like I don't need exactly 128 bytes. I, I just need a buffer, and if I get a 4K buffer, that's great. I can make make use of that. So that's why we we return both memory and size. And there's the deallocation function, allocated size, which we you can use to query how much memory was allocated at this specific pointer and some other stuff here. Uh, and to, we actually have, we actually override new uh, so that if you try to call new, it should blow up because we don't want to allow new at all. Everything should go to our allocator system. Now, as you see, if you open this file, override new, we actually disable <laughs> disable this assert on almost every platform. And the reason for that is just that there are so many libraries that are not well behaved. Like there are libraries that are, they take, they say that they give you an option to send in an allocation function and they will only allocate through that allocation function, but then they do some allocation using new or malloc anyway. So other people are not as, as disciplined as we are. Uh, so that's why we, have to have to disable this and we also have a scope for disabling this so you can disable this in a particular scope if you're calling out to a library that's behaving badly but on some platforms this will happen in a thread that that we don't control so we just have to disable it for the entire platform which is annoying uh, so but when this is enabled it's just uh, it's just we'll just throw when we get the call to new they don't use new. Uh, yeah, the libraries don't behave well. So to allocate using our system or a specific allocator, uh, you if you want to uh, if you want to allocate the C plus plus object, you'll have to use placement new. Uh, to so you first allocate the memory uh, using uh, the allocator requests a certain amount of memory. And then you call new with this pointer you get to create the object in that memory location. This is kind of annoying that 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 C++ has this weird weird super special syntax instead of just having some function you call for for creating an object at a certain memory location. So it looks kind of weird, but never mind. Uh, or if you don't want to write this out, we have macros that does this, so you can call our make new macro, which is defined in this allocator file uh, with uh, the allocator, the type that you're creating, and the arguments to the constructor, and it will do exactly this thing. Um, we also have some, so that's our basic 
allocate your base class. Then we have a lot of um, instantiations of this base class, uh, which are allocators used for specific purposes that do specific things. So the most basic one is the page allocator, because that's sort of the, the foundation of everything else. And the page allocator allocates virtual memory from the system. So it's basically, basically just an interface to the OS uh, virtual memory calls. Uh, so it has some functions for each platform. We have an interface for each platform where we have some functions for, for allocating memory uh, using the page allocator. There's one special thing about this, and that is that not all systems, so if, as you saw in the allocator class, uh, we have a function that returns the size of an allocation and not all virtual memory systems on all OSs allow us to query for that. On Windows, we can do that. So in Windows, we can ask um, how much memory, yeah, here. On Windows, we can ask, there's a virtual query function, and we can ask, yeah, how much memory did I, did I allocate from the page allocator at this address? But on OS X and iOS and Android and Windows, we can't do that. So we actually have to remember this size ourselves, uh, which is kind of annoying. Uh, so we have a special hash table for doing that, where we store the pointers and we store the number of uh, the number of pages that was allocated at that. And there are some special tricks here to make this, because this hash table is used a lot, because there's a lot of memory allocations. There are some special tricks here to make this faster. Uh, for example, we don't store the end. We don't store an entry in the hash table if we allocated just one page. So we would just assume that if we don't find it in the hash table, it would it had allocated one page. So we only store it if it allocates more than one page. So we have some like optimizations like that uh, to do this. But it's kind of annoying. It would be nice if we could just ask the system as we can do on Windows. Um, so this page allocator is kind of the basis for all the other allocators use the page allocator to get a chunk of memory, and then they divide up that up into smaller pieces. We have a heap allocator. This is like the most, uh, oh. uh, this is like the most common to what you would have on, this is the thing that's most similar to malloc. Uh, the heap allocator is actually a wrapper around around DL malloc, which is a, a well-known uh, heap allocator, uh, with some extra stuff just so that it will use our page uh, allocation system. So so it uses our page allocator to get more more memory for the heap when it needs it. And then there is a slot allocator, uh, which is used. Uh, it's used for small memory allocations. So the slot allocator, uh, well, good details here. The slot allocator will request the page uh, from uh, from the page allocator, and then we will shop shop that page up into uh, into slots of a specific size. So for eight bytes, for example, for instance, it will make a lot of eight byte chunks. Uh, of that page, and then it will use a free list to keep track of which of these eight eight bytes are are free and not. Uh, and the nice thing about this is is that it kind of avoids fragmentation because all of the all of the slots in one page are of the same size. We never have to move stuff around, and we will always have when we free something, we will always have a free eight byte slot there that we can reuse for another eight byte allocation. Uh, so for, for small sized allocations, that's, that's kind of nice. Um, on the other hand, you, you may have unused, unused slots in this system when you, if you allocate a bunch of eight byte sized objects and you free a lot of them, you will still have these eight byte sized uh, holes that you can't really use for anything else than other eight byte allocations. So it's kind of a balance uh, uh, between using this and a traditional heap allocator. So we go through this when when the sizes are small enough, we, we use this, uh, this allocation system instead of, instead of using the heap, just to uh, reduce fragmentation. It's also faster to allocate from this than to allocate from the heap. 
then we have the thing called the generic allocator. That's our that's the allocator that's used all the time. Like everything, almost any al allocation goes to uh, the generic allocator. And the generic allocator basically just calls out to one of these three allocators. Uh, so it has a function called owner, which determines based on the size which of the allocation which of the allocate which allocator it should use. So if it's small enough, it goes to the slot allocator and allocates one of these slots. If it's um, if it's big enough, uh, we use uh, the page allocator uh, and allocate it directly from the page allocator because that's nice nice too because then we we don't have to put it on the heap. We don't have to care about uh, fragmentation and stuff like that. We can just directly allocate system pages. And if it's not small enough and not big enough, it goes to the heap. So that's our basic allocation strategy. Yes, how oh, it comes up here later. Uh, so there's uh, to start up now. Everything is allocated through the system, and when we shut down, we make sure that we free everything. So this creates kind of a bootstrapping problem because the allocators need some memory. As you saw, the page allocator has a table of pages that it need, needs to keep track of the address of, address of uh, the size of, that has been allocated at each address. The allocators need memory, which is kind of tricky. How do we allocate the first allocator to allocate memory? And there's a nifty little trick for that. This happens in memory globals, which defines our, our global allocators, with the page allocator and so on. Uh, so what we do is we actually have a static buffer uh, of 128 bytes uh, of memory, and we create a heap, uh, a static heap that uses this static memory area uh, as its memory area, and it will allow us to allocate objects and it will be placed in this static buffer. So that way we can allocate our first allocators and then we're, we're up and running and we can just uh, use them to allocate the rest of the memory. Um, so we also have, uh, as Dan said, we also have the temporary memory allocator and that is used when you, in a lot of, lot of places in the engine, when you just, you need a little bit of memory in a function uh, just to do some processing. Uh, we could, could could use a regular memory allocator for that, but that's kind of annoying because it will create fragmentation, it's kind of expensive, and so on. Uh, so instead we have a special allocator for, for these uh, temp temporary memory allocations. This allocator is it's a <coughs> bit... I think the... Um... The allocator system in Stingray is one of the things that is least understood by people. And I think that maybe the temp allocator is probably the thing in the allocator system yeah. that people most misunderstand, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, there's some definite gotchas with the temp allocator. Yeah, so I'll try to go, go through it a bit in detail. So, so the temp allocator actually has, has multiple layers to it. Uh, so the basic temp allocator system is, is, um, something called a temp pool. And the way that works is that it, it keeps a pool of pages uh, allocated from the page allocator. And when someone uh, requests some temporary memory, it will go through this pool and hand it out uh, to that uh, function that requests some temporary memory. And when it gets the memory back, it will put it back into the pool. So it doesn't allocate and deallocate from the system because that might be expensive uh, uh, to, to take the pages and return them back and forth to the system. Instead, it keeps them it keeps them locally. Uh, and the temp pool is actually stored as a, uh, it's, a as it's stored as a thread uh, a thread local variable. So we have one of these temp pools for each thread, and that also creates interesting things when when you uh, when you do threading with temp allocators. But I'll I'll get through that. But so the temp pool is like um, the temp pool is the basic mechanism for 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 
for allocating temporary memory. But we also have another mechanism that is, a, that is used before it goes to the tempool, and that's just using a stack buffer. Uh, so the basic temp allocator looks something like this. It's called temp allocator with stack buffer, and it, it's a templated class uh, based on the size of the stack buffer. Uh, so that that allocator creates a buffer of that specific size, and when you request to allocate memory uh, from from uh, from a temp allocator like this, it will first use this buffer, and only when it's exhausted this buffer, it will go to the uh, this other temp allocator system with pages that gets recycled and so on. So this means that. In most cases, if you're just using a little bit of memory, uh, it all happens on the stack and it's super efficient. But also, but also if you need more memory, it's there. So you can allocate arbitrary amount of memory using the temp allocator. Uh, it will just go to the, uh, to this larger pool of allocations. But, but for smaller allocations, we can serve it directly from the stack, which is nice. So the temp, for, for the temp allocator, as you can see here, the, the deallocate function doesn't do anything. Uh, instead, all of the all of the allocated memory for the temp allocator is freed when the allocator is destroyed. So it will just uh, it will just keep on when you allocate memory, it will just keep on allocating that memory and keep on growing until you until you let go of the temp allocator object, and then all of that memory will be free. This can create problems if you're doing. If you have, for example, if you do a lot of resizing, if you have a, if you have a string, for example, or, or an array allocated with a temp allocator and you do a lot of resizing, then when you resize, the, the memory for the old size will never be released. Instead, you will allocate new memory for the new size in addition to the memory for the old size. So the memory will grow and grow. So you have to be a little bit careful when you use the temp allocator. I know this, uh, I know we run into this, for example, in the, I think when we parse animations, because some of the, some of the animation files can be huge, and we used to use a temp allocator for that, and it would just allocate like megabytes and megabytes of memory and eventually run out of memory. Uh, so, so it might not be, it might not be good to use it for, for those kinds of things, and you might actually want to use a, a proper allocator, even if it's memory that you, you don't need need afterwards. Um, so the temp so this this template class actually has two instantiations that use different amounts of stack buffer memory. So when you just write temp allocator, you get two hundred fifty six bytes of stack memory, and then it will go to that uh, the backing allocator. Or you can use temp allocator big, and you get a big, bit more stack buffer memory. And as I said, the, the, the pools here are based on a thread local variable, and that means that the temp allocator can only be used on one thread. So you can't pass, you can't create the temp allocator and then pass it from one thread to another. Uh, doing so will create pretty subtle bugs <laughs> that <laughs> those, I know these are bugs that people have been, tend to be confused by a lot when that happens. Uh, so we should maybe uh, consider making it so that the temp allocator stores the thread ID of the thread it was created on. Um, yeah, it might check that. Yeah, I think that would save a lot of headache. I think we should definitely, mm -hmm. definitely do that because uh, I know, I know, on multiple on multiple occasions, people have spent like hours on a bug and then oh, it was passing a temp allocator because it's kind of subtle. It might be that you pass an array between one thread and another thread. And that array uses an allocator that happens to be a temp allocator, and then everything will break. Uh, are there any questions about the temp allocators? So since since the temp allocator, when when people use temp allocator, of, often you don't care, you don't bother calling the allocate because you know it will release its memory afterwards. So you can just ignore it. Uh, so you'll see that sometimes that people allocate memory and then they don't free it because it's allocated with the temp allocators. It will be freed automatically. Um, so, uh, 
tracking memory allocations. Uh, we have a special allocator uh, called the trace allocator, uh, which we use to track memory allocations. So the, the trace allocator, basically all it does is that it, it wraps another allocator, which is called a delegate here. So that, that allocator that is wrapped by this trace, trace allocator is the one that will be used for doing all the allocations. Uh, so the trace allocator wraps that uh, and sort of creates a scope for allocations. It gives it a name uh, and then it keeps track of how many allocations there are, how much memory they use in total. Uh, and then we can query that later and see. So, so if you have a specific system, for example, like the sound system, the sound system will create a trace allocator called sound, and then you can query it and see, okay, this is the amount of memory that is currently used uh, by the sound system. And also the, the, the structure for the trace allocator will assert that all the memory uh, that was allocated has been freed. So that's one way for us to, to discover memory leaks. When, whenever you destroy one of these scoped allocations, it will check that the memory has actually been released. Uh, we also have a sort of information function to get statistics out of the allocator system. We can request to print the tree and it will print the tree of all these trace allocators because they, one trace allocator may, may wrap another trace allocator and, and there may be multiple levels of that. Uh, so you can see, sort of divide the memory into finer and finer, uh, finer and finer grain systems. So when you do a, uh, I think it's called memory stats in the console. If you print memory stats, it will print this tree and you can sort of see how much is, how much memory is being used by each, uh, by each allocator. Uh, so if you get, if you have a memory leak, your trace allocator will alert you when it's destroyed. So to act, act, actually debug that problem, uh, you would turn on tracing in the, in the trace allocator. That's why it's called trace allocator, because it's able to do that. Uh, so when you get a memory leak for that, if you don't, if you don't know immediately what the problem is, uh, you can define this flag, uh, to enable tracing in the trace allocator. And then you can edit this function to edit the name of the trace allocators uh, that you want to trace. So uh, tracing means that whenever an allocation is made, we will save the entire call stack of that allocation. Uh, so then we can, uh, so, so later when we get an error that says we have a memory leak, we will see the call stack of that memory leak and we can figure out what was going on. But recording the call stack is pretty expensive, so you probably don't want to do it for every allocation because then you will just starting the end, it will take forever. Uh, but since you, since you know which allocator you have problems with, you know the trace allocator that blew up when you, when you destroyed it and said you had a memory leak, uh, you can enter the name of that trace allocator here and it will enable tracing just for that particular uh, allocator. Uh, and using that, you will find the call stack for for the allocations that have leaked, and from there it's usually pretty easy to fix a memory leak. Uh, so other debugging other common uh, memory problems. Using memory after free or using uninitialized memory, other two other common problems. So to, to detect that, we explicitly clear memory. Uh, I think it might be only in debug mode, I think, or yeah, only in debug mode. Uh, we explicitly clear the memory with like, we fill it with 666 when we deallocate it. So if anyone tries to use it after free, it, they will get back garbage data. So it's at that point, it's usually quite easy to see that something wrong has happened. There is also a flag you can set uh, to be, to detect if we're using uninitialized memory. You can set the flag to fill memory randomly on that allocation, uh, which can be useful uh, to, to trigger some of this. Because sometimes, sometimes just by chance, the you will always get zeros in the in the uh, in the memory uh, that you allocate, and you might not see that you're actually using uninitialized memory. 
Uh, so all of this is in all of this is in the in the allocator code here. So it tests if it should randomize and it it will randomize. Oh, it actually if you don't have this flag set and you're running in debug mode, it's actually filled with six 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 on on allocation too. So you can detect that. So if you want to do something some other uh, crazy stuff to detect issues, you can you can put that in 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 the code here. Uh, so then there are the worst kind of memory to de the worst kind of memory problems to detect as uh, usually memory overwrites like something in your system writes to a memory address that it shouldn't do and that causes some other system to crash or do some other bad behavior at some point in the future and those problems usually hard to find because there might not be a strong relationship between where it crashes and, and where the error is and it's kind of random and um, it might be some time before it crashes. So we have some ways of dealing with this. Um, typically one way I, I start with this sometimes is just to disable some systems in the engine like if I if I suspect that it's in the sound system, I ask, I'll disable the sound system and is the problem still happening? Uh, and if it's not, then I know, okay, it's a sound system that does something bad. So that can be like a general tactics for this, this kind of hard bug. But we also have some things in the allocator system that can uh, help with this. So we have two allocators called the canary allocator and the end of page allocator. And if we suspect that memory allocated through some allocator is doing something strange, we can switch it out for one of these. So the canary allocator uh, will is an allocator that whenever it allocates memory, it will allocate a bit of extra memory and it will fill that with a known pattern, which in this case is just canary, 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 canary. And then when the memory is freed, it will look at that extra memory that it allocated and see if it matches, if it still matches this pattern. If it doesn't, it will know that whoever allocated and used that memory wrote out of bounds. So they used more memory than they requested. And so, so then this assert when the memory is free, it will be tripped and uh, we can sort of detect it. Um, so that might be good if, if the, that, that works if, if we're overwriting our buffer and if it happens, uh, if it happens before we free memory. But in a lot of cases, uh, the problem is rather that we are we're using memory after we have freed it. So we have freed it, but we still have the pointer around, and then we write to it at some later point, and then the canary allocator doesn't work. Uh, but we have another allocator, which is called the end of page allocator, which is really good at detecting these problems, but it's also super expensive. So the end of page allocator, uh, what it will do when you request memory is it will allocate the memory directly from the page allocator uh, and it will put the memory you request at the end of that page. So, so if you write beyond the memory, it will trigger, uh, you will trigger an access violation because, because you will go into uh, unalicialized memory. And if you use the memory after free, when we free, we free the entire page, it will also trigger an access violation because then you're using uninitialized memory. Uh, so this can be, this can be really useful for detecting these kind of, and then you get, the nice thing about this too is that you get the exception when the write happens. So then you, you're looking exactly at the bad line of code, which is writing where it shouldn't. Uh, so this can be really, really useful, but it's super expensive because we're rounding up every allocation to the page size. So if you have a lot of like eight byte allocations, it was, they will suddenly turn into 4K allocations. Yeah, that. Then you can detect it. That's not rare. Yeah, I think it's rare. I haven't run into that. You could like, I think you you could like, force it to end up at certain addresses. You can decide the address when you allocate okay. the page. Uh, we don't have any system for that. There hasn't been any need for that. But uh, usually this works if you just if you just know the allocator. The problem is usually that you don't know which allocator is behaving badly. So it might be anywhere in the system. But if you can kind of figure it out, either by 
Another trick is to look at the look at the bytes that actually been written and see if they look like something. <laughs> but in a lot of cases, it's just one byte. It's like zero <laughs> being written, and it's like oh. Uh, so there are some known issues with the allocator system that I would like to fix uh, going forward at some point. One is that there's too much locking going on. So this this trace allocator. Uh, I mean, the only, the only, uh, the only alloc most of the allocators are thread safe, so they can be called from different th threads. The temp allocator is not, and as we've seen, that leads to a lot of subtle bugs. So it's kind of nice that the other ones are thread safe, but it's also expensive because we take a critical section whenever we allocate or, or deallocate or do anything with the allocator. And this can be especially damning with the trace allocators because we can have multiple trace allocators. A trace allocator can wrap another trace allocator, wraps another trace allocator, wraps another one, and then wraps the heap allocator. So then we have this chain of allocators, and they all take critical sections. So it might be like a single allocation takes like 10 critical sections, which is clearly suboptimal. Uh, so maybe, maybe going forward, we should get rid of the current trace allocator system we have with all these levels of wrapping and use something that's more straightforward instead. Or maybe we should just look into having thread-specific allocators and, and avoid some of the locking that way. But there's definitely... I like, uh, I like the idea as, as much as possible of doing allocations per thread. Um, that's one of the issues that I ran into when trying to parallelize stuff with the data compiler. The current memory system, it depends on the, on the context a lot because there's certain things that work very well, but then there's other things where if you get to a certain amount of contention, uh, it, it all grinds to a halt. Uh, so it would be nice to be able to scale with that as well. Yeah, there's definitely stuff to do there. Another stuff is that I think in general, you should do fewer and bigger memory allocations. I mean, every, any system that's doing like allocating a ton of like 16 byte objects or something like that, that system is kind of badly written. Uh, so, so that helps too. Um, but, uh, especially with this, like if we're now paying like five critical sections for allocating 16 bytes, that's, that's pretty bad. We definitely don't want to do that. Um, Another issue is just in terms of in terms of general reporting and investigation. The system we have is not super good. Uh, we have no easy way of investigating fragmentation. Uh, the memory usage report we have this like uh, memory tree view. It's not super helpful to really for our customers. If you want to dig down into memory usage and really understand it, uh, you would need better tools. But we currently have. Jacob working on this uh, for his uh, thesis project. So he's looking into making better better tools for looking at memory, understanding what's going on. Because currently it's, it's kind of hard to know like what happens when you load a, load a level and then unload it. Like what happens to memory? Do we get fragmentation? Do we, what memory is left after unload? We, we don't have good tools for that. Did we consider doing something like that in JavaScript in a browser? Uh, I think it, Jacob started with JavaScript, but it turned out to be a bit slow for the amount of <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> amount of processing that needs to happen. If you want to do it real time, like handling all right, the okay. allocation data that comes in. All right, that's it. Are there any questions on this? Surely a ton. Yeah, we can deal with that in the next session too. If you have, if you think of something. All right, thank you. We'll do the next part on Monday. Thanks for doing this, Nicholas. Yeah, yeah thanks. thanks. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye.